Good afternoon, everybody. It's the home stretch. It's the last breakout session. I know uh, everybody's probably exhausted from uh, two full days of sitting through session after session. So I appreciate the crowd that's come out for this uh, final session. Um, and uh, this, the title of this session is Evolving from Today's Internet to Tomorrow's Digital Workplace on Life with DXP. And I have to confess that I came up with this title long before I knew what I was actually going to talk about. It's one of those situations where they tell you, hey, I need a title and an abstract. And it sounded like a really cool title. And, but once I started actually working on the content, I realized it might have been a bit abstract, a bit ambitious. I started creating all these slides with a lot of diagrams, with triangles and circles and squares, with arrows pointing everywhere, all sorts of analyst statistics and reports about the power of intranets and digital workplace and what it means to evolve from one to the next. And I realized that it was going a bit too abstract and I decided I think I need to scale it back and make it a bit more practical because I know that the majority of you guys in this room are here because you're probably already using LifeRay as an intranet or you plan to do so shortly. And historically, uh, intranets has always been one of the strongest and most popular use cases for why customers choose LifeRay to begin with. I think it's some, anywhere up to around 50, 60% of our customers are using LifeRay specifically as an intranet. So let me start a bit with the fluff and then I'll jump into a bit more of the concrete. At the close of yesterday's uh, session, the last keynote, uh, Mark Rennan from Forrester uh, talked about the need to be obsessed about the customer. He talked about Amazon and Jeff Bezos, who's of course very well known and uh, even notorious sometimes for being so customer obsessed and customer focused that nothing else really matters, not his competitors and sometimes not even his own employees. Uh, he shared this slide, which I found really interesting. And uh, I know it says at the bottom, reproduction prohibited, but I don't think Mark is here. So if you don't tell, I won't tell. Um, and, he, and it says here that customer obsessed companies have the highest and at the very top talks about revenue growth which makes sense, customer satisfaction, which makes sense. And this last part also has the highest employee satisfaction. It says 40% are more likely to report being happy at work. And it's higher employee accordions. I'm not exactly sure what the ACC is. Maybe accomplishments. Couldn't really see it with somebody blocking it. More employee motivation probably, lower attrition rates, and easier to attract new talent. And when I saw this, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, is this one of those causation things or correlation things? Uh, I feel like we have a bit of a chicken and an egg question. Is it happy customers that lead to happy employees or is it the other way around? Is it possibly happy employees that lead to happy customers? I wanna share with you a story about Continental. Um, this is uh, long before the merger with uh, United in, I think, 2009 or 2010. Uh, back in uh, 1994, so you know, we're dialing the clock back here, uh, Continental Airlines was hanging on by a thread. Within the last 10 years, from 84 to 94, they had churned through 10 different CEOs. Their stock prices were at an all-time low and they ranked dead last in nearly every airline ranking for every category. They were on the verge of their third bankruptcy. And as you can imagine, just employee morale at Continental was at an all-time low. When Gordon Bethune took over as president in October 94, one of the first things he did was adopt this culture of employee first. And he started making changes, starting with the very top. Uh, there used to be an executive floor in corporate headquarters on the 20th floor that was only accessible to those who had the title of senior VP and above. And he got rid of this. He op instituted an open door policy, allowing access to any and all employees. 
and he fired 39 senior VPs who just had trouble adjusting to this new open office culture. Now, over time, Continental went from being dead last uh, to winning more JD Powers and Associate Awards for customer service than all of their competitors. Stocks rose from two to fifty dollars a share, and they were ranked one of the top 100 companies to work for by Fortune. Now, is that definitive proof that focusing on employees will guaranteed turn a fledgling business around 180 from dead last to industry leader? Well, far from, but I think there is a lesson to be learned here. Some will say that it's about the customer first, right? That's Jeff Bezos' philosophy. Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks, he said, we built the Starbucks brand first with our people, not with the consumers. So which is it? Do you put employees first or do you put customers first? Well, I think asking this question is a little bit like asking within your organization, who's more important, the business user or the IT user? And maybe for this crowd, that might be an obvious answer. But it's the sort of question that can be debated and argued back and forth. Ultimately, there is a strong interdependency, both on employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. You really can't have one without the other. And there's all sorts of studies that have shown over and over that in order to satisfy your customers, you need to empower your employees and vice versa. Right? To satisfy your employees, you need to enable them to deliver delightful customer experiences. Uh, Mark, during yesterday's closing keynote, he also shared how it really isn't about the technology that's going to enable your businesses to be able to execute. It really starts first with culture. And he talked about how, you know, what am I doing up here? Talking about culture. This sounds so very pie in the sky. And uh, I'll just refer you to his talk to better understand why it is that the culture of your company is so critical to the success of your business. Um, but underneath culture, he also had technology. And technology is fundamental. It's, it's kind of the infrastructure, it's the highways, it's the ability, uh, it, it's gonna be the services that your employees are going to need in order for them to ultimately get their job done, to unlock their full potential and to get the most productivity out of your workforce. Now, when we talk about intranets, uh, digital workplaces. Uh, in its most basic form, we can think of an intranet as a kind of a private internet. It's a self-service portal of sorts, a gateway. And your employees will go in and it links, uh, has resources to a lot of links to either other applications. It holds evergreen content like your HR policies. Uh, it's a means for top-down communication from your leadership to announce news about your corporation, um, maybe some blogs about some recent developments. Beyond that core use of intranets, uh, intra intranet, they also serve to connect people to people. So not only are you connecting people to content or information, but your intranet should be able to unlock the hidden or siloed knowledge that other people within your organization hold. Uh, in its simplest form, this might be just a user directory and profile that shows their subject matter ex uh, expertise. Maybe it shows the projects that they're currently working on. And this helps to reduce duplicated efforts so that you can have a 360 view of what's going on within your organization. And finally, um, your intranet or digital workplace needs to connect people to processes. And this is ultimately getting stuff done. After your employees have been equipped with the tools, the knowledge, and the know-how, ultimately they need to hunker down and write code or get on that sales call. And a lot of times technology will impede 
the ability for your employees to meaningfully or effectively accomplish whatever task at hand. And again, studies and surveys have found that companies that are technology laggards, uh, those who are on the bottom 10% in terms of the source of technology and tools that they provide for their employees, have five times the attrition rate of employees of technology leaders, those who are trying to provide their, uh, their employees with the ble bleeding edge tools and technologies that they need to get their job done. So this is just a very high level overview and somewhere in between steps one, two, and three, we see the evolution of what you would traditionally call the internet to the digital workplace. Um, I, I imagine a lot of the folk in this room, in your usage of the internet, we're really somewhere between one and two. We're just getting started, somehow finding ways to make sense of and surface this wealth of data and content that exists within your organization. And maybe you're leveraging some of the more social collaborative features within Liferay, like message boards or wikis, to be able to connect people and to somehow collaborate. Um, number three is where you really start to dig into a lot of your custom development, handle your more complex business processes. Um, but more out of the box, we're typically looking at one and two when we think about intranets. And we've yet to really explore or empower building applications or building uh, the tools that our employees need to really ultimately get their job done. So I want to get into more of the concrete heart of what's coming up and what are the sort of tools and expectations that you guys can have that will uh, hopefully empower, further empower your intranet solutions in DXP 7.2 and beyond. And I apologize, I wish I had mock-ups and pretty pictures, but this is going to be a lot of text because we have not yet quite gotten to the mock-ups and designs uh, for 7.2. So when we think about content, um, we know that this is the heart of any organization. It's data. Right? Data is the very lifeblood that's going to drive your ability to understand your customers and understand your market. And you can't drive customer engagement if you don't know what's happening, right? both inside and outside your organization. And we know data is growing at explosive rates, 40% increase year over year over year. Within 10 years, the amount of data that we have will have increased by 10 times. So unless we're somehow able to make sense of all this data that's entering our system, somehow be able to structure it, categorize it, all of this data just becomes more noise. And I'm sure this is a familiar experience for all of us. When you have documents that don't have the proper metadata around it, it just ends up cluttering search results, or you have expired an old content that is giving you a false view and understanding of what's actually current. And I don't know how much this statistic is to be believed, but IDC, they claim that knowledge workers spend up to 20% of their working hours just looking for information. So that essentially means out of your work week, you're just dedicating all of Monday, just looking for content. And so one of the investments we plan to make in 7.2 and beyond is to really lay the framework to better understand and categorize your assets. Um, much of the initial focus in 7.2 is going to focus around documents and will eventually expand to the rest of what Liferay understands as assets, which is anything from blogs to users and anything else that implements the asset framework. So the first thing we need to do, and this I think has been a highly requested feature, is the ability to bulk metadata edit. Anybody who's uh, uploaded uh, 50 digital assets, images, videos, PDF white papers for say North America Symposium into a folder, knows that after you upload, you have to very painfully go through every single one, and I see some nodding heads in here, and it's a painful process, right? Uh, so we are going to introduce the ability to, uh, bulk, uh, to, to do bulk metadata editing so that you can automatically tag all of these assets as 
symposium and maybe you have a structure by region. So you could also put it under North America for your structure. Um, beyond that, we also plan to add machine learning driven auto tagging. And this is one of those things that we've been playing around with for quite a while actually. And it's not too difficult to get a very simple implementation with any one of the uh, tagging services that are available out there. But what we're really working on is implementing a system that's configurable to learn based upon your specific domain. Uh, if you're in aerospace manufacturing, for example, you don't want every image of an airplane to be tagged as airplane, especially if 80% of your assets are some form of an airplane. So we want to uh, be able to configure I'll provide the configuration settings to the machine learning algorithm such that it's able to even distinguish between a Boeing 737 or an Airbus A380 um, and uh, be able to kind of specify the parameters and the limits for how it decides to tag or suggest uh, how to tag your content. One of the main purposes for why we understand the ability to tag, categorize metadata, as simple as it sounds, is so important, is because one of the major, major, major themes that you'll hear about in 7.2 is the focus on personalization. And it, in order for personalization to actually work, you really need to understand your segments. You need to understand your target audience, you need to understand the content, and you need to understand how do you draw the bridge right, between these two entities. Some of you may have heard the good news that 7.1 is the last version that's going to have audience targeting. Why is that good news, you ask? Uh, because the core functionality of audience targeting is going to be baked into 7.2 core. And so we're really going to allow personalization across the entire DXP platform, which will, we expect, have a huge impact for your intranets and, being able to deliver targeted content, targeted announcements and blogs to your employees and to your customers as well. Uh, we're also uh, planning on adding a framework to consume third-party assets. And third-party assets is any asset, and initially it'll be files, that sit outside of your Liferay domain. So we're going to start with out-of-the-box implementations uh, it'll, it'll ultimately be a framework, but an out-of-the-box implementation for YouTube and Vimeo videos. And we know it's a common use case where on your websites or training videos, you'll have some sort of company, um, sp a company approved content that's going to sit somewhere outside of Liferay. But for Liferay to be able to understand and to make sense of this data, we need to be able to also apply tagging and categorization as well as permissioning in order to show, uh, again, uh, personalized content. So to show the right YouTube video, if you're onboarding a new hire, uh, for example, um, by putting them in a certain segment as new hire, as well as maybe they are a uh, front end developer, you'll be able to target the content, not only for files that are, exist within Liferay, but outside of Liferay as well. Uh, the framework, which will all eventually allow you to surface content like large CAD drawings or surface content from your third-party ERP systems or your Adobe Premiere video files that are you know, hundreds of megs or gigabytes large. And again, surface them as if it was native content within Liferay. And uh, third, this was uh, one that actually came, I think, uh, explicitly from uh, Perry back there, um, is CDN support for protected resources. Now this one, we are still in the evaluation stage to see if this is something we can actually provide out of the box. Uh, but we know that streaming videos, for example, from uh, Liferay, it quickly or, will get bogged down and it doesn't scale. Um, you only have so many application threads, and so you can't serve hundreds and thousands of streaming videos to your users simultaneously. Um, at the same time, CDNs are traditionally for 
publicly available content. So how do you, for example, make an internal training video and serve that to maybe the thousands or tens of thousands of users within your organization? Uh, our global services team has actually created a custom implementation that's able to create a time-bombed link with, I think they did it with Akamai or Cloudflare, I don't remember which CDN provider. And it's a solution that they've uh, implemented across a few customers. And we believe that at least for perhaps the major CDN providers, we can provide this out of the box, make this simply a configuration setting so that you're able to serve these large uh, resources to hundreds or thousands of users simultaneously. Now, on the people-to-people -people side, uh, this one is tricky. This is going to be a bit more. In 7.2, what we're introducing is person-to-person -person sharing. I'm sure you guys have all faced the problem of you have some content sitting in one site, and you have a user in another site who's not a member. And to give them access, you either need to open up permissions, or you need to make them a member of the site. So this is just uh, a very simple mechanism so that you can share the marketing case study white papers on the marketing site with uh, anybody within your domain. Um, but this is really just laying the framework for ultimately what we want to provide, which is not just person-to-person -person sharing, but person-to-group sharing. It's really, we're trying to think, how do you break down the very top-down hierarchies that LifeRay sites tends to lock you down into? Um, you know, sites and that top-down hierarchy, it made a lot of sense when LifeRay was first created 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but today, especially with this understanding that you know, we don't exist in just one department. We may be part of the engineering department, but you're part of a multi-cross-departmental team that involves engineers and sales and support and a product. Um, so we're starting with person-to-person -person sharing. and that larger framework to break down the sites, I know it becomes very complex and very fast, especially because of LifeRay's permissioning system. But we're looking into how do you really make LifeRay a platform that will allow greater social collaboration and, and activity. Oh, and I am missing a third slide. OK, uh, I apologize. So there's a third slide. You can tell I, I was working on these slides until about 11.55. Um, is the per, uh, person to uh, the uh, people to processes. So um, I apologize for not having the slide, but uh, you may have attended Charles Pignon's session about the enhancements that we're planning to do on workflows. And one of the goals and one of the themes that you've heard all throughout Symposium is we really want to empower your business users to be able to execute so that, again, IT is free to innovate and work on the more complex or custom scenarios that really require their specific skill set. And so we're really looking at what are some of the common use cases that you face within an internet scenario and a lot of times, this involves workflows that involve not just a single asset, a single document, but really multiple assets and integrations with assets even outside of LifeRay. So one of the features that we are working on is the ability to integrate with Office 365 and possibly uh, Google Docs and Office 365, the latter being kind of challenging because of licensing issues, um, as well as uh, e-signatures and um, uh, there's one more that I'm missing. But I'll, oh, and also be able to convert uh, files and assets from one format to another. So I know that's just a, a kind of a, a hodgepodge list of features. But let me give you the use case that we are evaluating. So we have a real world situation within LifeRay, which I imagine is very common and similar for you as well, where say our global services team is engaging a new customer. And so uh, they're dra they draft a statement of work to describe the full parameters of the project. And this statement of work might go back and forth internally between the consultant 
as, and the legal team. So this will go through a number of revisions. Most likely that collaborative editing is happening within Google Docs or in Office 365. And so we want to surface that content directly within Liferay. I think right now there's some third-party uh, marketplace apps that provide similar functionality, but we plan to make that a first-class citizen uh, within Liferay. And let's say once that statement of work is more or less finished, you want to send it over to your customer for review. So uh, as part of that multi-asset workflow that's been created, uh, it reaches the next stage where it's presented to customer for their review and for them to sign. Let's say the customer pushes back on a few points, red lines. Now in this process where the document goes back and forth, since we're working outside of your own organization, uh, you need to track every revision of this SOW that goes back and forth between you and the customer. And so using LifeRay's versioning system, uh, as well as uh, uh, LifeRay's uh, enhanced workflow engine, uh, we want to track every rendition, every version of this document as it goes back and forth. And finally, when it's approved, both sides are happy uh, to integrate a workflow with e-signature services like DocuSign so both sides can fully execute the document and then surface it on your customer portal uh, for them to uh, reference. So this is a use case that we face all the time within global services, and it's something I imagine is common for you guys as well. And so we are trying to build these features with a complete end-to-end -end use case in mind so that it doesn't just become a bunch of you know, hodgepodge features that 80% work, but we want to make sure this works as one seamless process. So that's some of the stuff that's coming in 7.2 and laying the uh, groundwork for 7.3 and beyond. Um, but I want to talk about some of the things that we've been thinking about that goes way beyond the scope of 7.2. Uh, this is a bit pie in the sky, and the reason I'm bringing this to your guys' attention today is because I really want to get your feedback and your perspective on some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of what's happening in the market when we talk about digital workplaces. Now, I imagine in this room, we span all sorts of different industries. Some are highly regulated, like finance or government, and others are maybe more collaborative, like retail or marketing. Regardless of which industry you come from, intranets tend to be pretty similar uh, Whatever industry, regardless of the industry that you're in. Right? Uh, you always have the need to disseminate somehow information top down, uh, to have a directory and understanding of what people are working on what. Um, you have the need to approve PTO requests or onboard new hires. And as technologists, our inclination is to always take a DIY mindset. We want to build it ourselves. We dream it, we imagine it, the designers kind of give us a, a, a vision of what it might look like, and we like to execute, because that's what we do, right? we like to build. But just like the commoditization of cloud infrastructure, it's making it harder to justify all the investments put into maintaining and building your own server farm. Uh, this, there's a growing trend in these out-of-the-box cloud-based intranets that's gaining traction not only with small and medium-sized businesses, but also larger enterprises. Because even if you're a large enterprise, you're not necessarily a technology firm. You don't necessarily want to hire an entire mobile development team so you can create native apps for the internet that you're creating. And these out-of-the-box cloud-based uh, intranets, they tend to promise business value within weeks, maybe months, instead of the typical deployment for a uh, customized life rate internet, which can take anywhere from nine months to two years. Now, there's always going to be a need to build very customized solutions to handle your business's unique processes. Right? That's what makes your business you. That's where your competitive advantage lies. But you don't want to spend all your IT resources reinventing the wheel, 
building the same things that everybody else is building. You really want to re, uh, focus your IT resources on the innovative technologies, the ideas, the innovation that's going to set you apart from your competitors. And so we're trying to think of how do we create a solution that is going to take some of the most common repeatable elements of an intranet, free that from uh, your responsibility, and yet at the same time, provide LifeRay's highly flexible modular uh, architecture for you to build your own custom solutions. Um, wow, well, I talk a lot longer than I always expect to. Well, um, take this slide with a grain of salt. This is just our designers just ideating, going back and forth, think about some ideas. But one of the ideas uh, that we are really evaluating is the, um, and I'm kind of afraid to say this, but the spiritual successor to social office. And I know that might send some bad vibes considering we had deprecated social office. But I think the value proposition of social office was there. The execution was uh, rather lacking. But what we want to do is basically create a cloud-based intranet that's able to connect to your library system, which already houses a lot of the content, a lot of the understanding of who people are, what departments and sites uh, they are a part of, and allow a uh, using a, our new cloud uh, platform on DSP Cloud and our new services like analytics and CDP, which is a concurrent session that's happening right now, allow you to still build the custom processes that make your business you. Um, but at the same time, be able to leverage some of the bleeding edge technology and developments that's happening, like being able to leverage machine learning and AI. Again, fields that you don't want to invest and hire data scientists to try to figure out. So we want to provide basically a cloud-based intranet that's going to connect to your various, not only life ray systems, but also invest heavily in integrations to third-party software, like Google Docs and Box.net, so we can have a 360 view of all the knowledge and all the content that exists within your organization. Connect to uh, Slack and Teams, so we're able to understand what people are doing, understand what's happening within your organization and also integrate with uh, business tools like Salesforce, HubSpot, uh, Zendesk, so we can have visibility into, um, not only visibility, but actionability into your various business processes. Now, I know this sounds kind of very pie in the sky, and this isn't something that we plan to have out you know, next year, but we're really trying to leapfrog. Think about not only what is the digital workplace of tomorrow look like, but really look at the digital workplace of let's say the day after tomorrow. Uh, we want to uh, really imagine right, where, where our organization is going right, when they're thinking about solutions like intranets and digital workplaces. And if this resonates with you at all, you know, I would love to hear your feedback, or if you think this is a horrible, horrible idea, I'd also love to hear your feedback. And yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out. I apologize for uh, keeping you over for a few minutes. But if you have any uh, questions, I will be up uh, around here. I think there's another session going on, but I'll be available afterwards as well to field any questions. Right, thank you.